Hi everybody, uh, welcome to the ESN YouTube channel. I'm Andy Colthorpe, editor of Energy Storage News at Solar Media. So we've prepared a short video blog for you, rounding up some of our best content of the year, and we'll give you some pointers on what to look forward to in 2019. So back to the general myth-busting theme that we're tackling today. Um, and one you hear all the time is energy storage is too expensive and the only way you can really make big money from it is from grid services. So I'm hoping we get some opinions on this. Oh, for sure. I'm going to jump in on that one. Go um, for it. <laughs> yeah, the, the grid services is, of course, one area and we've seen it as a low-hanging fruit in many ways. And mm. it's something the batteries, particularly you're talking about fluence technology, can do very well. The speed mm. of response, the, the flexibility of it. Um, essentially means that you can displace traditional resources that have been providing this in the past, the conventional thermal, um, with a relatively small portion displacing a very large amount of that traditional market. So it, it's a very easy entry sort of point to mm -hmm. a market. But yeah, it's a challenging one from a business case perspective because you don't usually get very long-term contracts for, for that. We're seeing storage being used for a lot of more interesting things and um, there's two particular areas maybe I, I, I touch upon now there's more I could go into but I don't want to uh, uh, you know, go on forever so one particularly uh, started out in the US but now it's, it's propagating to other markets which is storage actually working and displacing traditional generation traditional peaking assets right, yeah. which particularly in the US sit there a lot of the time run on average, uh, so load factor is maybe like 5%, five, five sometimes less. So 95% of the time you pay for an asset that sits there to do nothing. Um, and the rest of the time it then provides this, this ability to, to meet the peak demand. Now storage can do that uh, just as well, and we're now actually seeing that the capital cost of, of something like a four hour battery is already lower on an upfront basis than traditional peakers. Sure. And not only are you solving that problem, the battery is doing something useful the rest of the time, mm -hmm. whether it's the, the duck curve in California of all the solar during the day that you're moving into the, uh, you know, into yeah. the evening, yeah. uh, whether it's frequency regulation, whether it's something else. So, so that's a really good example of, well, it's not too expensive, it's cheaper than the traditional solution. Sure. So it's already a all these projects are commercial, so they, they have to, by definition, be doing something better than that's already there. Sure. And the second one I'll mention is also very interesting, is transmission and distribution uh, infrastructure alternatives. Right. Um, so we've seen a number of, 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 sort of pioneering utilities um, that have deployed these sort of systems that we've uh, supplied to them. Again, they're sort of two to four hours, slightly longer duration, um, mm -hmm. so they're not just short duration frequency regulation batteries. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But they're there to essentially defer investment that you would traditionally do into a substation to manage, say, a lot of solar being added at a mm -hmm. distribution level, creating backfeed issues. Mm -hmm. And the time value of money there is extremely valuable. Alternatively, putting it in to be an alternative to building, say, something like a transmission line. And you can do that robustly. You can have an asset that's 20 plus years of life from a storage standpoint, and it will have that same infrastructure um, standing credibility. Mm -hmm. That opportunity is very huge because the need, as we're moving towards this decentralized, bi-directional world, mm -hmm. is significant. And, and storage, again, is doing those jobs better than, uh, than, than traditional uh, solutions. And when you're looking at that, that's where it will scale. Because if you treat it as an infrastructure asset, there's a huge amount of infra infrastructure funding out there, low cost of capital, that if you can invest in a bankable asset like that, and that's the anchor revenue stream, that's the sort of future I see. And so services will always be there, but that's what they'll uh, be in the case of a lot of these business uh, models. They'll be an add-on to the side, but your anchor revenue stream will be something like this capacity need or the mm. or the, mm. the T and D. Yeah, alternative. and that that T and D area, you know, it's been described as non-wise alternatives to yeah. you know that's the kind of phrase that's been thrown about. And yeah, just uh, to interject a little bit, yeah, we'd like to point people in the direction of we've had quite a lot of content on the site and people talking about that. And obviously, we don't have the numbers to hand, but there's some quite impressive estimations on what it could be, and it's. It's been a kind of almost a theoretical sort of use for storage that's actually gone into, you know, in the last year or two, actually really gone into utility planning, in particular in the US. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so I'd urge people to take a look and look up what non-wise alternatives can mean. At the end, what we're striving for is to uh, use green energy locally when it has been where it has been produced, and a part of that is 
to uh, the self-consumption or auto-consumption. Mm -hmm. It will be the traditional first use case. And then we try also to maximize the integration of the renewable. I mean, it's called the flexibility is the key, so to say. Huh? So um, if you would look at uh, Germany, but I would uh, take also other countries, uh, the, the biggest cost for balancing the system is the cut element of the, of the uh, wind and PV. Yeah. And uh, here, if you have a, uh, this is not the traditional ancillary services as you would know it, yeah, but this is also part of using the flexibility. You have a, a decentral asset, very flexible, and you multiply the use cases, it improves the overall business case for, for the end customer. Yeah. And by the way, for the society, uh, grid defection is, is, is not a topic right now in, in Europe, but this will come at some mm. point. Yeah. Mm. You guys have brought, yeah, quite a cool uh, little augmented reality app to um, to bring the uh, the product to life. Yeah. So what it's trying to do is let people see inside. So our generation three product, which we launched today, uh, we think is the best in class flow machine globally. Uh, and a flow machine is good for heavy duty, daily cycling, long duration storage. But what we've particularly done on the generation three model, and we've used years and years of research is embedded functionality inside the machine to make more money for the customer. So it has specific functions from our engineering design into the machine to make more money. So the augmented reality is helping people look inside the machine and see what we've got in, inside it. So we're not just selling a product anymore, we're actually designing a purpose-built storage system to make more money. Right, I mean I do want to ask you about yep. that functionality. Yep. But hang on a second. You just said lithium and vanadium together in a hybrid system in yeah, Australia. Yeah. This is something that you and I were talking about a while ago, mm -hmm. and um, to me it sounded great. No one was actually putting their money where their mouth was, yeah. so to speak. Just maybe just elaborate a bit more on yeah, that. Yeah, so I think people have done it on a research mode, um, but we've had a, a research program planning for three years to optimize power. Lithium is a great battery technology, it's cheap power, but it's not very good when you want to use it often. You know, you need a lot of software to protect it from degrading. Flow is great, it's your workhorse, you want to use it all day long. So they're opposite technologies. So what we're showing in the Australian project is putting both of those technologies together, which means the client can make much more money on saving energy bills, providing grid services, and do everything on a flexible asset. That's at a one megawatt hour scale, so it's pretty decent for commercial behind the meter. Yeah. What we've actually designed is big grid systems now with lithium and flow together. Because big grid storage is all great for frequency response, but that's all people can do with lithium, where we can do everything on flow. And if you put flow and lithium together, you get a great asset that sits there for 20 years, no matter what energy policy does, and can do all your services and um, de-risk the business model for investors. So actually thinking of storage, what people do, in my view, is they're lazy. They don't think about how they're gonna make money, and it's about designing the right technology and the right solution to do what you need. And then lithium is great. We sell lithium batteries and we sell flow machines, and we'll design the right solution. It's already, it's behind the meter, it's in a commercial installation, so yep. that's more than just a pilot or a trial, isn't it? That's, that's, there's an economic... This is real, real it, life yeah. grid, yeah. microgrid in Australia, and it's really good. So what they'll be doing with it is the PV, the solar, they'll be capturing hours of solar during the day, putting it in the flow machine, filling up the battery a bit, so it's a one hour lithium, five hour flow. Right, okay. And then we'll be discharging overnight, we'll be buying power off the grid with both systems during the night, and then we'll be doing some frequency response on both the lithium and the flow. All the short frequency calls will be done on flow because there's no degradation. So every time you trade off a flow machine, or you do frequency response, it has zero cost. So you want to save the lithium because it costs you every time you use it for when you have big power spurts. And then you can actually protect the lithium and it's a really good technology. But if you're using the lithium for everything, all the little bits, you kill it. So the flow becomes very good on all the short frequency calls or the short trading and the long stuff. And then you protect the lithium when you make big amounts of money for your big power spurts. So it's a really neat mix. So the client in Australia is finding out all these new things they can do with storage. And everything new you can do is cash flow. You know, and that's what life is about, sadly. Um, so it's all about the economic case and thinking about how you get the right technologies to make the right amount of money or more money.
ago, uh, you were saying, and there was a fairly clear understanding in the industry that economically the prices were still, you know, still at the upper end of the trajectory. Yeah. Now, obviously those prices have now fallen, but then with things like the introduction of the virtual power plant, it seems that on the other side, there's more... Economic the value stack. Value, yeah, exactly. And, and maybe just talk about that for the benefit of... Sure, so, so, so just to comment on, on pricing, we still don't see that the trajectory of price reduction is as we want mm -hmm. because it's like, kind of like in the early days of PV modules, there's not enough raw material like lithium and cobalt, so there's a lot of fluctuation in prices. But everybody understands that with, between phones and cars and storage, stationary storage systems, the prices will go down. Mm -hmm. In terms of value stacking, yes, people now understand that there is more value in a solar plus storage system like this than just managing your home energy. If you're a utility company and you have multiple thousands of solar systems in, a, in an area, you can use them to defer investment in grid. Yeah, you sure. can use them to uh, defer of buying expensive energy from fast acting pickers and fast acting power stations. You just need a technological solution for that. A utility cannot be expected to check the status of 10,000 systems, calculate and solve how much energy to take from each and one of them to keep the balance, and then dispatch them. You need layers of solution that, gives that, that give that to them. It's not deployed in mass scale, but we already see these solutions. We start to provide these solutions, and now there's a new value. The utility can now invest $20 million in beefing up the grid or much, much less in storage plus PV plus some aggregation solution. So that's a value stack. Um, and there are more on that relating to demand charges, relating to the gap between wholesale price and retail price. PV with storage is becoming one with the grid and that is, that is uh, the evolution of PV. Sure. Virtual power plant solution, you know, you, you might have picked up that is something that I've been really excited about mm -hmm. as an idea. You know, and three or four years ago, it wasn't theoretical because it could be done, but it wasn't really at scales. Right. And it certainly wasn't being retailed as a solution, right. as far as I'm aware. You right. know, maybe in a couple of specific Probably markets. Probably not. Probably but we've not. now already seen the Solar Edge VPP being deployed in the real world setting. Right. Do you maybe just want to talk us through, I think one of them was Australia with Australia, AGL. Australia, yes, correct? with AGL. Do you want to maybe just talk us through, firstly, the, the sort of scale and scope of those projects and then what benefits they're bringing economically and environmentally. And so and I'll talk about the benefits, less about scale because sure. uh, not everything is uh, public information, but uh, in terms of benefits, the, 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 the main benefit that as a network operator you get from a, a virtual power plant is the ability to dispatch energy when the, when the grid needs it. There's a shortage. Most of these shortages are either created from a fault or from the growth in demand, but then you have this shortage for a few hours a year in many cases. And it's like you don't want the, the build the, to build a road system for one very, very busy afternoon and in the rest you just in, in invested a huge amount in infrastructure. With VPP and storage you can <laughs> defer investment, that's what's called a non-wire alternative. Sure. You can uh, 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 um, not only defer investment but be better prepared for faults without actually deploying all the hard cost of, 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 of a fault, fault proof solution. So that's the value in many of these projects. Other values we see with energy retailers. If you're an energy retailer, energy supplier that sells energy, the deal is that you sell to your customers at retail price and you buy electricity at the wholesale market. And if the wholesale market surges because there's an issue on the grid or there's just a shortage of energy, then you start losing money immediately. If you could at that point dispatch energy from all of your customers, back into the grid, you could prevent buying some of the electricity on the wholesale market. You need to compensate them, you need to give them, but you can give them something that is between the surge in the wholesale price and the retail price. So you can hedge, you use a VPP to hedge against surges in wholesale prices. That's another solution that is becoming popular.
Hi, I'm Oli Amos. I'm the Commercial Manager for Energy Storage News. Uh, wishing you happy holidays. I'm looking forward to working with you next year.